record, what association are you getting? And let's hear some random comments, if you will. Fortress, very good. Arid, very, very good. What else? A heroism, bravery, religious fundamentalism, going unchecked, and I'm hoping to get uh, I'm hoping to get some you know some controversy going on here. Everyone is being very polite. Mass suicide, that's a very, very true statement. Let me ask a provocative question. Masada, Jewish heroism or the Waco, Texas of the ancient world? Any comments? Okay. Let's uh, let's move into the show in the slideshow and try to figure that one out. Let let's move in there. So guys, someone has been very naughty, and there's this short YouTube movie I used for the slideshow, and someone took a shot with a drone, which is completely and utterly forbidden by the park authorities over there. But since it already exists and it's public, we might as well watch it. Yep, Idan, I'm waiting for something to happen here. Um, and if it doesn't work, uh, we'll just move on with the slideshow. All I've got, all I've got is like a spinning uh, thing here on the screen, and it's not doing anything. Okay, so I'm going to exit the uh, the slideshow. Whoops. And then we'll move in the beginning. It's not a not a huge deal either way. Well, I think I think the movie kind of uh, kind of got my PowerPoint stuck here, so we're, we'll. Uh, okay, so let's forego the movie. But you're, so you're welcome. You're welcome to do some uh, uh, philosophical discussions ahead of time if you'd like. Uh, while I'm while I'm preparing. Now, guys, we'll forego the movie, and now I insist that you go there and personally to see it in moving color. The movie is not working for some reason. Okay, guys. So a visit to Masada with me will be on one level about the technicalities because Masada is a feat of engineering. Masada should not exist exactly like a whole mountain which God has chosen for his temple being flattened and enlarged to fit the ambition of one King Herod the Great. Masada should not exist exactly like a port city where no natural bay exists and a swimming pool surrounded completely and utterly by a salty sea. And no one on earth should have swimming pools and millions and millions and millions of gallons of water on top of a mountain in the middle of a desert, which doesn't get any rain ever. And yet, Herod does that constantly. And there's a message here, which is, ye mortals, the rules of physics that apply to you do not apply to King Herod the Great. My friends, please look at the very famous snake path. This is a trick laid by King Herod to any would-be attacker. Notice that even if someone was able to overcome the first obstacle in the first line of defense of Masada, which is its location. It's completely and utterly isolated from the rest of the world. And you can bring 10,000s of your buddies down there, and then you can figure out how are you gonna hydrate, feed, and shelter 10,000 buddies out there next to a body of water that drinking it will kill you on the spot. You march your people single file on this snake path, you're gonna have very, very, very few people by the time this is done. And King Herod created this in the first century before Christ. And we may not confuse the two different eras which are relevant to Messiah. 
Herod, and Eleazar, the son of Yair, which is 70 to 74 AD. So there's a good 80 years gap between the two eras. Let's continue. Okay, so views from Masada. For those of us who enjoyed the TV show Game of Thrones, which I love, Masada is actually twice as high than the Westerosi Wall, than the fortress that the imagination of J.R.R. Martin came up with. Let's continue. And you know, reality is crazier than the imagination in this case. Guys, for those of you who have not been up there, there's a whole town. And yes, the first word that comes to mind often is fortress. And this is what it literally means in the Hebrew language, metzada, fortification. But during the reign of Herod, this fort also doubles as a five-star resort between the years 40 to 37 before Christ, the three boys, Herod, Herod, and Herod, Archileos, Atropas, and Philip, are housed there while their father ran away to Rome for three years. And the Jews were able to dispose of the Herod kingdom, but Herod's family was safely kept in Masada for three years until Herod comes back with a Roman legion to reconquer the Holy Land. And the Jews who wanted nothing more than to kill Herod's family never made an attempt on Masada. And this is a perfect weapon, a weapon which prevents violence. Let's go and see it. Guys, the war between Jews and Romans, which Josephus Flavius chronicled in his very, very lengthy and very, very interesting book, The War of the Jew Against the Roman. Let me use this imagery to, in a nutshell, tell you what's happening. Look at the Jewish artillery pieces on the right-hand side. Look at the Roman artillery piece on the left-hand side. The Roman artillery piece is a uniform. They're always the same exact size. They're always the same exact weight and their artillery is a science. The Jewish artillery pieces in this post-New Testament era happens to be the same exact technology that King David used in 1000 BC. We have not progressed militarily significant in 1100 years. And David being able to defeat Goliath only happened once. And I'm going to give you the one-liner of the war of the Jews against the Romans. It was a horrible idea. Let's continue. Guys, this is the water cistern, one of the six cisterns which are on the surface level of Masada. When we're going to go there with a group, we're going to try and understand how Herod did what he did, I want you to appreciate, guys, I should have just stood there so you understand that the size of this means that there's hundreds of thousands of gallons in this cistern alone. And I wish now that I just stood there to give you the human size. It is 10 feet underneath bedrock, which means no water will ever evaporate. There's 10 feet of bedrock sheltering the water from the desert sun. You can see both on the door and the bucket hatches would have had wooden windows and a wooden door, which means the water will never be exposed to sunlight and never have an opportunity to develop any algae. Last but not least, you can see on the walls of the cistern, the hydraulic plaster, which uniforms and smooths out the bedrock, preventing any water from ever being lost 
two cracks in the bedrock. This is profoundly advanced technology. And there's obviously no way that El Azar and his brigands will ever have the tech manpower or economic resource they simply took over what herod created three quarters of a century prior let's continue guys this is the bet midrash and i try not to perform bar mitzvahs in masada and masada Bar mitzvah ceremonies are very popular with Jews both in America and in Israel. I personally try to go to a place called Umil Kanatir that I guess we should have a slideshow with a lecture in a future date. But this is the exact accurate and original schoolhouse of the children of the town of Masana, which exists from 70 to 74 AD. The children who went to school here never graduated for obvious reasons. And Masada has become a symbol for the Jews because of Operation Masada II of 1941, which we should definitely talk about if we are able today, then today. If not, we'll have to do it in a later date. Let's continue. And Masada is a massive, massive, massive plateau. This is a not particular interesting part of the plateau. Uh, let's go, so let's continue. We are a little short on time. Ophir, you want to stop for the, ah, wonderful, wonderful. This is very interesting and very important. Guys, Technically, it's a little hard to see in this slideshows because the slides are a little small, but can you recognize the same hydraulic plaster that we already saw in the water system? In this case, this is a pool, which was a private pool during the first era or the first layer, the time of King Herod and it becomes a public pool during the second era, the township of Masada, 70 to 74. Notice how it's virtually the same. No, not a mikvah. Very good question. Swimming. And Jennifer, I appreciate your question. It's a brilliant question. And there are mikvahs in Masada. And the township of Masada definitely required mikvah, whether the royal household of the earlier era just couldn't care less, although they are technically Jews. This is a public pool. It means it uses the same tech which the Citroen uses, but where the Citroen architecture is designed to protect the water at all costs. In this particular case, it's to allow easy access to the water with no regards whatsoever to the evaporation. The water here evaporates. Now, in the Middle East and in the desert environment, we are governed by a system of government called hydrofeudalism. We call our country the Jewish state of Israel. Our esteemed neighbors in Jordan call themselves the kingdom of Jordan. In Syria, I don't know how they call themselves today. But in the desert, there is actually one reality. He who controls water controls everything. And what fancy name you call yourself, it's okay, it's up to you. But the bottom line is, he who holds the water holds the stick. And for those of you from Lush, Wisconsin, I know it's, there's a big cultural gap here, but out here in desert country, this is a very, very true, harsh, and very blunt reality. So you understand what Herod is doing is almost sacrilege for a desert dweller's mentality. He is using water in such a affluent and elaborate way in such a place where water is so scarce and hard to come by. 
obviously this is a statement. And how did Herod get so much water in such a desolate wasteland exposes the true genius of this man. Let's continue. Okay, Idan, what do you uh, say we take a, a five-minute break here? Five-minute sure. five sure. break. Uh, I have a message here on my phone that my first two clients are heading to Israel, and they requested that we show live, uh, you know, their, their departure for Israel. So let's see here and uh, share the screen. I would like to see it. <laughs> okay, so let's, uh, let's see if I can get this going here. If anybody wants to turn on their TV or watch with us, <clears throat> let's watch this historic moment. That's awesome. Yep. Our first two clients are done. Yeah. And you know, this is uh, also very appropriate, you know. Ancient and ultra modern <laughs> intermix. I love it. I love it. Ophir, did you know I guided NASA when they were here? Yes, you sent me a picture. Yeah. yeah. The letters from the astronauts. Yeah. yeah. Good luck to our American heroes. Yeah. And you know, with all this Corona issue, I want to go to space until this is over. I understand. Okay, if it's 50 minutes away, I think we should continue with the lecture. And then 50, 50 minutes away? It says so. There's a little clock there on the left. Oh. Okie doke. You know, so, that's interesting. I thought, I thought it was now. I thought it was 3.20 Eastern time. Uh, maybe I missed less it. Less than now. two... It's less than two minutes away, according ah, to... Ah, so let's get back to it. Yeah. A, a minute and a half. Really? Okay, let's get back to it. So guys, Captain Kirk is my third cousin. I'm very serious, I'm not kidding. I know what happened. I, I paused the uh, video before, and so it started from 50 minutes ago. That's mm -hmm. what was going on. Here, did you know Kirk and Spock are both Jewish? <laughs> no. Yes, I'm serious. I'm not kidding. Well, I know. Um, yeah, I think, I think I know that, yeah. Whoever, uh, whoever mentioned the 50, uh, the 50 minutes before, thank you very much for, for fixing the mistake. This is cool. That is true. This is a very true statement, definitely. Hallelujah.
Okay, we done. Um, what should what should we do? <laughs> I'm not really sure. I, this is so fascinating. Um, is. I guess whoever wants to continue watching the the space can keep their TVs on, uh, and I will. Uh, let me just uh, let me just uh, stop it in my in my headphones here and. Uh, Wow, that was super awesome to watch. Just absolutely super awesome to watch. Um, let me uh, go back to the screen sharing here. And Masada, this is kind of weird, Idan, going back to, uh, to uh, you know, from, uh, from the uh, ancient times to the, to, to the modern times. I love it, actually. I, I love it. I love this uh, dichotomy. Yeah, this is really weird, I have to say. Very unique. And hopefully humanity will learn from its past and not take all of these issues into space with it. <laughs> I hope so too. That's the one peaceful place that's still left for us. Okay, very good then. So uh, I think our, our uh, uh, beloved astronauts are now getting uh, peanuts, uh, you know, on their, on their journey. Uh, they're at the, uh, it sounds like uh, everything went well there, which I'm very happy about. And um, let's, uh, let's continue with Masada, Idan, as, as, Surrealistic as it might be. <laughs> yeah, no, let's continue to the next slide. Okay? okay, very good. Wonderful. My friends, look at the mosaic art. Okay, this is a 2100. No, no, not this one. Next slide. I'm sorry. Oh, next wait, wait, wait. One. Hang on. No. 2100 year old original piece of art preserved to perfection and the dryness and extreme dryness down down there has been very very advantageous for the preservation of the material finding please look that at this building which we call the western palace 
Herod built a villa for the Jewish portion of his personality. Please note the complete and utter absence of any graven image which complies to Jewish custom rather than Roman custom of that era. Please also note that the quality of the workmanship here means that Herod imported someone from Italy, a master craftsman, and brought him down there to get this done in Masada. What I'm trying to say, if I'm going to analog to America today, this is a home which is supposed to be in Bel Air, Beverly Hills, or the highest possible epsilon of society. And these homes exist in first century Judea, but they're always in gated community, usually for the Jewish priest's class. John the Baptist would have been born into something like this. The house is not unusual on its own right. Its location means that this house that belongs in Beverly Hills, this mansion that belongs in Beverly Hills, is somewhere in the Ozarex or the Rockies or the Appalachians in the middle of the desolate wasteland completely and utterly blocked by itself. This is highly irregular. Let's continue. Wonderful. The private tub or bath King Herod built for himself inside this villa. And my friends, this Jewish villa is the more modest out of the two accommodations King Herod built for himself in the same mountain. The other house, the Roman style house, the guy went completely and utterly ballistic. Let's continue. And this is how this house, this is how the high priest Caiaphas would live like. This will be the same standard where St. Peter would deny Christ. But that will be in a gated community in Jerusalem, which I have a few possible candidates. Guys, on the left-hand side is the indoor running water toilet. And on the right-hand side, I have bread and butter for an archaeologist. What we do in archaeology is we usually compare stuff to other stuff and written evidence. In this case, my testimony is one, Josephus Flavius. Josephus Flavius was never at Masada. Josephus Flavius did read the battle reports that every Roman officer in the Battle of 74 kept a journal, and he had access to all of these journals. And according to this, he written his historical account, which means the very dramatic speech that all the guides like to stand there and stand there and read Josephus Flavius, he made it up. And he's using the writing style of the Greek tragedy that was very, very popular in the classical era. Which means one of the things that pl plagues the Israeli guide and archaeologist is where is Josephus accurate and where is he not accurate? In this case, I have a wonderful, wonderful piece of evidence, and my material finding and my testimony are corresponding beautifully to one another. You can see on the lower level a piece of art as exquisite and wonderful as the one we previously seen from the first century before Christ. At a certain point in history, a second tenant move in, and that point in history is exactly 70 AD after the burning and sacking of Jerusalem. And the group of brigands under the leadership of Eleazar, the son of Yair, moves in to the then abandoned fortress of Masada. And these guys need to support a much larger community. They're four, they're four times the number that the royal household ever been, which means someone took that beautiful, beautiful, beautiful artwork. And you can see on the right-hand side, 
a fire pit. That the second tenant, the zealots, didn't appreciate the fine art. No one said they had the education. And their wants and needs were completely different. They needed a community kitchen to feed a much, much, much larger population. Which means what I get through Josephus, in this case, I'm very, very satisfied also with the numbers. It all adds up. Let's continue. Okay, my friends, I hope I have sufficiently proven to you that there was water in that place. Nevertheless, how do you raise crops? And the soil down there is worthless. And this man, Herod, this genius, builds these towers on the exterior wall of Masada. He also builds many, many, many towers. And each one of them small cubicles is a nesting place for a dove, which means this desert fortress replenishes its water supply constantly, or annually at least. And the doves who reside there by the millions will be a source of protein and a source of eggs and also a endless sorts of pigeon poop and if you have enough pigeon poop you can spread it on that massive plateau roughly ankle deep and then you can raise whatever crop you want in that desolate wasteland which means the owner of masada gets to grow fat and anyone else living in the outskirts gets to die in the desert perfect military fortress Let's continue. The Roman ramp, which General Flavia Silva creates in 74 AD, and the guy who was a very well-educated man looked at the snake path. He knew exactly that if he uses that snake path, the whole Spartan, the 300 Spartans that have funneled a million Greeks, a million Persians into the Temple Lion Pass and nullified their numerical advantages, all that all over again. Eleazar, the son of Yair, has 320 semi-professional soldiers. Flavia Silva has 10,000 professional soldiers. And he orders his 10,000 men to build an artificial mountain denying Masada its height advantage. And when this artificial mountain is complete, at this point, the balance of power means that the 320 semi-professional soldiers don't stand a chance against the 10,000 professional soldiers. What they should have done is surrender. But what they actually did was murder the children and the women and commit suicide. I submit to you, Elazar did it on purpose. This was drama, it was theater. I don't think I have within the hour to go into all the details, but bear in mind that rabbis write against this very, 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 very strongly. And suicide is forbidden to a Jew under any circumstance whatsoever. There's no such thing as suicide. In the halacha, our laws, a person who is commit suicide is punished, even post-mortem, by burial outside of the cemetery. And yet, in 41, Masada becomes a cultural icon. We and I need to elaborate on that. Let's continue. 1941, my friends. The Torah, the scrolls of the Torah. This is an original piece. And this is the copy of the scripted Torah, which the zealots of Masada had in their possession. And when we, were, we are physically there, I will introduce you all to my good friend, Rabbi Samson, the scribe, who sits there and scribes the Torah over and over and over again to be distributed to all of the Jewish diasporas 
all over the world. And we've done this to prove to the world that the pen is mightier than the sword. And it took us a very, very, very long time to get this point across. Let's continue. The synagogue of Masada. Notice that there's a small section of the synagogue which has been sealed off and closed. And it's an active synagogue. And it's owned by one of our security agencies. And Rabbi Samson, who sits in there and scribes the Torah, is in the employ of said agency. Let's continue. Wonderful, the water model. And my friends, it's about 45 miles between Jerusalem and Masada. Jerusalem sits at the very edge of the Fertile Crescent, which means the small little 40 mile radius from the Mediterranean that actually gets rain. And then it's another 45 miles, 45, 45 miles to the Dead Sea, which is complete and utter desert. And Jerusalem sits there in the middle, in the center of it. Jerusalem is also about 700 meters or 2,100 feet above sea level. And Masada, the lowest place on the planet, is 400 meters or 1,200 feet below sea level, which means the altitude difference here is going to be one mile between Jerusalem that actually gets rain and Masada, which will get no rain whatsoever. Or I've seen rain there once in my life. It also means that there's the annual flooding of that part of the country, which we have issues during the rainy season. And Ophira, I'm sure, is familiar with the tragedy that we lost some high school kids because their principal was too stupid to hire a fellow like me. And this is genuinely dangerous, my friends. When we're down there, we're going to get into it more detail. But please, on your leisure, write on YouTube, Flash Floods, Judean Desert. I am not kidding. It's life-threatening. This cannot be emphasized enough. It means millions and millions and millions of gallons of water per year will always want to go down there in the form of flash floods on account of gravity, the altitude between Jerusalem and Masada. It means this genius, Herod the Great, took 45 miles of land and a natural phenomenon and turned it into his personal water-hogging system which means he capitalized on the natural ravines as much as he could. And when there weren't enough natural ravines, he then created artificial aqueducts. And I'll show you some of them. And let's continue. The Northern Palace. And my friends, you can see that Herod went completely in utterly crazy and the palace is on three different levels and when this was a active residency it was built and designed to accomplish the optical illusion that the whole thing is floating in the air and yet again you can hear the echo of this megalomaniac and madman Ye mortals, the rules of gravity may apply to you, but not to King Herod. Hey, I'm swimming in a swimming pool. I can waste water when all of you are dying in this desert. There's messages here. Let's continue. Okay, another wonderful thing, which I'm very fond of, and it's a bit of a schlep to go there physically. But this is the original paint job. And what happened here is a one in a million deal. 
And you can see on the left hand side, the original paint job from 2,100 years ago. And the extreme dryness of the desert simply preserved it. But it only preserved in a certain part of the building that never got hit by direct sunlight for the last 2,100 years. Guys, the summer there is brutal. We have fatality from heat exhaustion down there every year in the summer. Nothing survives that summer. And if you look at the left picture, you can see a one in a million deal where we got the original paint job, which you're looking at what King Herod looked at. And the right hand side, the park wanted to do a reconstruction. It was all good and well. And the park hires a whole string and a whole line of Israeli artists. None of them can do the job. And the park, once again, now the Israeli government and its uh, park authorities has to hire a specialist from Italy to recreate the frescoes in the same style Herod did it 21 year, year, 2100 years ago when he hired a specialist from Italy to do it for him to begin with. Let's continue. And as you can see, archaeology is always a work in progress. Israel may be the size of New Jersey, and yet we have 35,000 biblical archaeological sites which we know about. And I'm promising you there's many more which we don't know about. I myself will be doing similar work to these nice people come July. This is more of a reconstruction than a excavation and my team did the reconstruction for Caesarea which we talked about on the last slide show. So these are my peers uh, who chose this uh, angle of, for a career. Let's continue. My friends, the bathhouse. And look at the very right side. And you can see this is a floating floor. It means there's a massive, massive, powerful furnace which brings in hot air from underneath the floor. There would be an iron cauldron in the center of the room. And the hot air from underneath the floor would evaporate the water in the iron cauldron, which means. The water would then evaporate and create a sauna, which is just as effective as any modern sauna you ever went into in your entire life. And when a drop of water then solidifies on the ceiling, when it falls down, it then automatically evap evaporates again, regardless if it fell in the cauldron or not, because all of the floor is heated. Which begs the question if the Romans have the science of meteorology. We can create very, very, very strong metals. The Romans can obviously manipulate steam to achieve a desired effect. Why on earth do we only get the steam engine in the 1800s? And the reason for that happens to be slavery. The Roman Empire is a very, 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 very sophisticated civilization. Technologically, they are almost as sophisticated as we are, minus our electronics, which they could not have conceived. They do not have the Judeo system, Judeo-Christian value system, which means we dislike slavery. And yes, there were issues, but a Jew and a Christian believes that every single one of us is made equal in the image of God. And God gave each and every single one of us free will. And it's not within the rights of any person to take away the free will that God gave to a different person. In the Roman world, this does not exist. 
which means why did not the Romans come up with anything to mechanize and reduce the cost of labor? Because they don't pay for labor. And in the Roman Empire, for every free citizen of the country, there are 10 slaves. This is the dynamic over here. Let's continue. Wonderful. My friends, this is a 2100 year old aqueduct. This is the original Herodian aqueduct that brought in water from the natural ravines and the artificial aqueducts into pre made massive water cistern, which means this entire mountain was hollowed out like a beehive. It looks like a mountain from the outside. And the cistern, which I've shown you, which is massive, contains hundreds of thousands of gallons. The real cisterns contain millions of gallons, and they're in the bulk of the mountain itself. And let's continue. Okay, I believe this is it. Um, before we depart, any idea why Masada became what it is? Why is Masada such a status symbol for the Jewish community? Ophir, in your many years in this industry, how many bar mitzvahs in Masada did you ship in from the United States of America? <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's an endless list. It's an endless, endless list. Of, endless, endless. endless list. It's, a, it's important for bar mitzvahs. It's important for, uh, it, you, they used to do military uh, swearing in ceremonies there. Um, what else? I mean, it's just, it's just uh, an iconic, iconic place in Jewish uh, traditions and history. Yeah. Ah, I beg to differ. Okay. And which is why you're the guy. <laughs> and Masada, and this is the point. Okay, and we we're trying, and we went for the slideshow, and we talked about the technicalities of Masada. It is a wonder. It's and amazing. It's one of the best archaeological sites in the world. Simple as that. And yet, why would someone pay thousands of dollars, fly thousands of miles, to bar mitzvah his children where men butcher their families? Like, I feel there's you know, there's an internal flaw here in the logic. There's something off here, something wrong. And the reason has actually nothing whatsoever to do with the events of Masada in 74, which the Jewish tradition never endorsed and never viewed it in a positive light ever for 2,000 years. Rabbinical scripture is 100% against what happened here. And says, you need to choose life. And if it's the will of God that we live in slavery, we have to live in slavery. That's it. There's nothing you can do about it. In 1941, Irving Rummel was parked in a place called El Alamein. It was 160 miles south of Jerusalem. And he was, or Hitler was in an open alliance with the leadership of the Palestinian people, Haj Amin al Husseini, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. And although Rommel is not a Nazi himself, where he conquers the SS, soon follows. And the death camps in the land of Israel were chosen to be in a place called. Jenin, which is south of our city of Haifa, which means if there is a successful Nazi invasion here to the Holy Land in 41, 1941 AD, all 600,000 Jews in Israel are going to be rounded up and brought to those death camps, exactly like what happened to our brethren in Europe. It's the same thing all over again. 
and the state of Palestine comes into existence as a German protectorate. Guys, you can go and look it up. Under this very, very extreme circumstance and very extreme duress, our leadership at the time, David Ben Gurion, a man called Yitzhak Sadeh, Igal Alon, Moshe Dayan, and others, and a man called Shmaryahu Gutman, come up with an operation which they codenamed Masada II in 1941, which means in an event of a Nazi invasion, the British were ready to pull off. They knew they're not going to stand uh, a chance. They're going to load all 600,000 Jews, men, women, and children, to Mount Carmel, Haifa, and the place has been bunkered. The foxholes are made. We can physically go and see. Everything was made, okay? Everything was prepared. It was good to go. Now, how do you prepare the public opinion of these Jews to all go to Mount Carmel and all die to the last man, woman, and child? At this point in history, which is only 1941, our leadership goes on a massive history rebranding campaign to prepare the public opinion for this event, for this circumstance. Luckily for us, the second battle of Alamein was a British victory under General Montgomery. The Nazi threat was blocked, but only 160 miles south of the city of Jerusalem. And Masada II was never activated. But the mountain for Masada II was prepared, and the public opinion of the Jews was also prepared. And now Masada becomes the iconic status symbol it is until this very day. And this is why the military swears in and people fly thousands of miles for the bar mitzvah services. This is the reason. If the world doesn't understand that there's a big gap between what happens in Masada and how the Jewish collective subconscious is conditioned to think about Masada. And right next door to Masada, there is a lovely resort strip with many fine hotels. Ashley, you're going to one of them. And in those hotels, there are towels. And I wish to invite you to steal these towels. And stealing towels from hotels is a Jewish tradition. <laughs> and Jews have perfected this tradition to a level of a form of art predominantly in the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York. <laughs> Mass suicide, on the other hand, was never a Jewish tradition and is not to be glorified under any circumstance whatsoever, okay? So anyone who comes to Israel, steal as many hotel towels as you wish and never engage in such laborious activity, ever. On behalf of the Israel Hotel Association, I'd like to please ask everybody to calm down with the towels. Don't take this seriously. <laughs> okay, my friends, this was in a nutshell. I promise you guys, we have at least four or five hours worth of stuff we should talk about from Masada, but I'm only allowed one hour. So if there's any questions, I'm very happy to take them. Sure. Let's see. Let's see if anybody has any questions. We'll open it up if anybody wants to chat any questions or open your mic. Uh, meanwhile, while you're thinking about the questions, there's an interesting archaeological find uh, in Israel uh, from the past few days. As you can see in the north, the spirituality, the center was the wars and the spirituality in Jerusalem and Asada. But the south, they were having fun and uh, they were relaxed. And so this is in Tel Arad, which is not too far from, uh, from Masada. Correct, Idan? Arad is not far from Masada. No. Yeah. Okay. Not at all. Uh, my friends, there was a great, great, great archaeological discovery in Beit Shemesh. And my next lecture, which 
God willing, I'll be up and about, will be about the Ark of the Covenant, and what happens to it from Shiloh and being lost to the Philistine by Phineas, Hophni, and Hophni, and I don't know how to say in English, and Phineas, the two sons of Eli, the priest, until it comes back to the place of Bet Shemesh, and that will appear in Samuel. And the, the altar in which the Ark of the Covenant has rested in very, very, very high probability was discovered in December last year. And I was not allowed to talk about it publicly. I knew about it, but I was under strict orders not to talk about it. And I wish to make this the topic of the next lecture, but I'm currently not allowed to go out there and have a photo shoot. So, all right, God well, willing, I'm sure, this. I'm sure it'll come. I'm sure it'll come soon enough, Idan, because it's absolutely fascinating everything you're teaching us and telling us about here. So, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, I don't see any questions, any type. So, as usual, Idan, you did such a good job that people don't have any questions. Uh, but. Uh, um. We'll okay, see you later, guys. Okay, Shavuot Tov, Shabbat Shalom. Uh, good luck and Godspeed to our astronauts out there on the, outside the, uh, the atmosphere. And uh, we'll see you all uh, uh, on the next lecture. Thank you very much for joining us. It's been an honor and a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, be, be safe, be happy. We'll see you next time. Shalom, shalom. Shalom, shalom. Bye-bye.